everyone, I'm Sloan from SloanBella.com and I'm back with another channeled missing person video. Now this person went missing from a beautiful little middle school called the Skyline Middle School in Portland, Oregon. This little bespeckled second grader had his knapsack on, his stepmother drove him to school, and he was super excited to show his science project at the little elementary school science fair. And he walked into the school and there are pictures of him, the last pictures anybody ever took of him, his stepmother took as he stood in front of his project. About 8.45 a.m. that morning, this little boy, Kyron Horman, went missing. He's not been seen from since. The school did not let the parents know. They somehow negated that, which I find interesting. The stepmother doesn't know where he is. Apparently, nobody knows where he is. Now, this happened on June 4th, 2010. It'll be almost 11 years this June, and I can't even imagine that. Kyron Horman was born on September 9th, 2002 and he was a cancer rising with a Virgo sun and a Libra moon. Now when I looked at the chart that I found online it was extremely interesting to me. There's a thing in astrology known as intercepts. This is when one of the signs in the chart is not on a house cusp. Usually we have this you know from Aries, Taurus, wherever it starts in your chart it goes around the zodiac so all 12 cusps have a different sign on them, usually doubled up sometimes, but usually there's a sign, so you know where the sign is. In this instance, his 12th house cusp is Taurus, Gemini is what's called intercepted or missing, focusing the energy right there, and then we have a late degree Gemini Saturn at 28 degrees of Gemini conjuncting the two degree Cancer rising. Now Saturn in the first house is almost always indicative of somebody that ended their most recent past life super quick through their own reckless behavior, whatever that may be. In this particular instance, Chiron came into this life literally dealing with the past life as he birthed into this life. So he came through specifically to clear out the most recent past life. And as such, he utilized communication skills. He's all about communication skills, but here's the issue. It's hidden in the 12th house and it reflects on his ascendant. Now, what I've always said about cancer, cancer is the most abandoned, adopted, or orphaned sign of the zodiac, and you might as well add neglected to that as well. That is why anybody, cancer, sun, moon, or rising, is constantly looking for a sense of family because there is a sense of abandonment from early on in life. It doesn't actually mean that it's specifically directed at the person, but just due to circumstances. This could be somebody dying in your early childhood. This can be somebody having an addiction problem. This can be moving countries, a world war breaks out. Somebody has an illness that everybody has to focus on. So the child is, quote, tossed off to the side or the person with the sun, moon, or rising in cancer. Now, he's got Saturn in the 12th conjuncting that ascendant. What's interesting about that is if he'd have made it till his eighth birthday, that karma would have shown itself clearly, but obviously he didn't. The other thing that he had that struck me as interesting was he had the sun conjunct Mars in the fourth house, showing me the apex of where that energy comes from because that was with the father's energy. Now, I'm not blaming any parent, but the father in this instance was the one that opened the door to the past karma that both he and his son shared. The mother seems to be the mirror or the reflection of it and was basically somehow energetically removed from the situation at the time that he went missing, meaning she was to step back. I'm talking on a spiritual level, not like in Earth, I know she was present as his parent. His moon is in Libra and the moon is conjunct Mercury, which means he communicated a lot with his mom. He communicated all the time with her. They had a good connection. The connection between him and his father, now this I'm going on psychically, was very, it was actually very good. And what he was showing me was the fact that he was tickling his son. He would show me that his dad used to tickle him and he really liked it. But then his dad wasn't present enough for him. His dad was always on the go somewhere else. So on the go, I'm on the go, I'm on the go. This could be due to age. This could be due to a bunch of things, meaning when you're immature, young, whatever, young, you know, younger people. And we're going back over 10 years at this point. Now, with that intercept, Sagittarius is also intercepted. 
in the sixth house, which means we are going from the spiritual world to the physical world. So there's a spiritual manifestation in the physical world. Now let's get back to the story of when Chiron went missing. What I felt from him, the first thing I felt from him, and again, when I say him, I get images and impressions. The impression was that there was a very tall, or at least he looked tall, angular man who showed up in his late 60s. I feel he's connected to the mother's side of the family. I feel there's a connection to Colorado or Arizona. He wears a cowboy hat, likes to show me the cowboy hat, and he likes to wear blue jeans, and he picked Chiron right up and scooped him right out. There was no pain felt, and I'm going to get into that a bit later, but there was no pain felt with this little boy as he crossed over, and he crossed over almost immediately. I would say within four hours of leaving school that morning, and I distinctly see him leaving school with his stepmother. I don't care what they say. I don't care if he wasn't seen. I don't care if the teachers say, no, we don't know where this kid went. I see him leaving school with his stepmother. What I see around that is I see an old pickup truck, a young man with dark hair, kind of like hazel green or lightish eyes, but not totally light, more hazily towards green, not dark and not blue. And I see him with a t-shirt, blue jeans, and he's younger than the stepmother. And I don't know if this is her son. I would say this person looks to be about 20 to 30. He leans against the wall. The pickup truck is there. There's a bait and switch going on. He has cigarettes in his hand and they seem to be Marlboro cigarettes in my head. I'm not seeing the word Marlboro, but I catch a flash of the red on the package. Again, this is 10 or 11 years ago, so maybe this person quit smoking by now. But I'm seeing that. I feel that this this man knows what happened, and I, I almost feel like it can't be her son because there's a sexual connection to this. There's a vibe that is sexual to me. There's also a female involved in what happened, another one besides a stepmother, who knows what happened and is also sexually, energetically connected. Now, the stepmother, Terry... I feel with her that she uses her sexuality and I don't mean, I'm not saying like, you know, she's the most sexual or the least sexual. I'm talking energetically. I'm not talking about what she looks on the outside. I'm talking about her in energy on the inside is very sexual and therefore magnetic to people who want to be around her. So there's that connection to the energy being very vibrant. It has nothing to do with her appearance, actually. People make that mistake. Well, she's not, you know, whatever, insert comment. It's not about that. It's an energetic thing. So she was very overtly sexual with every single thing she does. Everything she does comes at it from a very sexual point of view, from her energy, and it lures people in. It's magnetizing to her. Now, the other thing that I'm seeing and I totally flashed over to it, was there's like the Roman Empire or people in the times of Rome and the Roman Empire being taken down. Sounds a little bit dramatic for this particular instance. However, we all know that children don't just go missing from school. And so the last person who was with this child, actually the teachers in the classroom should be accountable. I know they know somebody saw it because I can see the stepmother walking back out through the parking lot with him. I can see that in my head. So I don't know what's going on with everybody. Uh, I guess you can't really say anything unless there's definitely like a body or a person to recover and that's not happened in this particular instant. But what I get is I get that there's a betrayal that's going on from lifetime to lifetime to lifetime. She was very, and this is going to sound uncomfortable. I don't quite mean it the way it's going to sound, but she was very sexually possessive of Chiron, meaning I don't think she did anything to him. That's not where I'm going with it. But the energy of him was very, very not protective, um, possessive, sexually possessive of him. She wanted to consume and possess him and this possess him. This comes to me from a past life between them. So there's something about them in the past life that's really entwined together and it's in a sexual way. So when she came into the family, she used her sexual whatever bravado to get into the family through the husband the father now you know men young men younger men all men okay don't get mad at me men they tend to like to see you know women flirting and that kind of thing and 
I really feel like the connection between the father, who I feel his name is Cain, if I remember correctly, and Terry, I feel like that went all the way back. I feel like before they even got married, before they had a second kid, before any of that, I feel like they were together. So I am actually seeing this Terry very covetous of Desiree, the mother of Chiron, and very, very sexually possessive of the child. This again is past life. She's also very sexually possessive of her women friends and sexually possessive of her own child, which is, I mean, I'm talking about her own child, her son, the son she came into the marriage with. They only had one daughter together, I believe, and Chiron was the stepson and her son would be the stepson to reverse to the father. But her energy comes at it from, um, that kind of power of sexuality. So when I'm seeing that, I'm assuming she's using her energy that way. Very jealous of the mother. And here's what I here's what I actually see. I saw Chiron on the other side. I saw him grab his mother's hand and I saw him grab his father's hand. And I saw him put the two hands together and I saw him hold both of the hands as they were clasped together. And I see him walking energetically or dimensionally through the picture in my mind with his parents. And I feel like he has nothing but love for both of them. Weirdly, his mother carries most of the guilt and most of the shame. She carries it on her. She wears it. He does not want her. She wasn't aware on purpose. It's, it's very odd. But at the time that this woman, Terry, entered their life, and I have a feeling it's before when she moved in as a nanny and, you know, then married the husband, don't let the nannies in the house. No offense to the nannies. Anyway, I have a feeling that she really coveted Desiree before that because she's like a cougar stalking her prey for sexual power, all right? So who's going to be her prey? Her prey is going to be the man because that's who she has sex with, but who's she stalking? The woman. This is what I get. I feel like she stalked Desiree. This is by no means or no way any of these people's fault. Now, here's what I saw on the day that little Chiron went missing. First of all, the man in the cowboy hat with the mustache, who's tall, wearing blue jeans, walking down a really wide open road. And I see mountains with little peaks of snow, Colorado or Arizona. I have no idea which, but I want to say both. And he's walking down the road that way. And he's got Chiron in his arms. And I can see Chiron's little face peeking over his shoulder. And it's very cute. He was immediately... Uh, you know, moved out of the experience. Here's what I get. The stepmother, Terry, had a habit, had a habit of giving this kid some kind of medication in either his food, his drink, his whatever, his juice snacks, you know, his cheese sandwich, whatever she did, she fed him something. I suspect it's something he drank in. So a lot of the time, this kid was kind of knocked out in ways that, you know, so she could take him with her and do things that she wanted to do where she wouldn't be noticed. So she kind of put this kid to sleep. Meaning I, she could have given him Benadryl. I've known people that give their little kids Benadryl to knock their asses out. So I'm seeing her give the kids something. So when he left the school, and this is what I get, when he was with her in the car, I remember him having an uncomfortable feeling. The reason that I'm being shown that his mother carries so much shame or guilt or both and or both is because her son told her that he didn't like his stepmother and he was afraid of her. It's actually what he said to her. And I think he was saying it for approximately three months before she passed. Now, I'm not sure how old his baby sister was, half sister. I'm not sure how old she was, but I feel like probably before that kid was born, he began to feel energetically, this kid is super sensitive. I'm talking about Chiron. He began to feel energetically that he wasn't wanted around or you know, there was some kind of a problem with their interaction. And I feel like he started to tell his mother this. The other thing that I see is that he basically got in the car and fell asleep. I see his head nodding forward like this. Then I flash immediately to binoculars, not the kid doesn't have them. I'm just seeing binoculars. Somebody's looking through binoculars and they're looking out into like where people bird watch. There's like marshy ground or muddy ground and they bird watch. People go to bird watch. That's what I'm seeing. And I am seeing some sort of a bait and switch car goes this way, but then another car goes this way. They're actually in this car, not this car. And somebody knows about the car change period. I feel like 
Terry, the stepmother, will promise anything to anybody to get what she wants. So if she needs a man to help her, she'll say, you know, I'll fuck you, I'll do whatever, I'll marry you, I'll give you money, whatever it is. She says that that's what she'll do in order to get, you know, the ex whatever it is she wants, right? So when I feel this with her, she's extremely manipulative with everybody, but it comes on from a sexual energy. So here's how I want to word that. It, I'm not saying like everybody was having sex with her. It's not what I'm trying to say. This is an energetic thing. And if you use that vibration, it taps into the root chakra of most of our desire, the, the way that we desire things. So when you are tripped in your desire area energetically, you're more apt to lose track of what's really going on. Okay, I'll speak for myself. Put some chocolate cake in front of me. I might not be paying attention to what's going on across the room because I'm looking at the cake over here. She had a way of making people feel valuable through that sexual energy, which gave them a boost in energy in order for her to get what she needed to get done. It's, it's a hard thing, but I can actually see it almost in color around her. Now, when Chiron went missing, there was another female. I see her with dark hair. There could have even been some gray in her hair, slightly older, kind of a round face, kind of a tomboyish look. Well, this is how I'm seeing her. I see her with a shovel and I see her digging. I at first wanted to say that he went into the river because I saw the bird watching glasses and was figuring it was that body of land where there's water and, you know, um, I think it's near the Columbia River and all of that. But then I saw the other woman with a shovel. So there's some sort of bait and switch going on. And I feel like there's two different locations for the body. This to me means that something that he owns or has or had on him is over here. And then the body is over here and or they switch the body into two different places, which is really strange, but that's what, I, that's what I'm actually picking up. When I look at his energy, um, I feel like he's always, always, always around his mother. He grabs her face like this. He loves her face. He plays with her like this with her. He puts his hands in her face. He needs her to see him. And I don't know, I have not read or heard and I was very hesitant to do this because I can't even imagine having a child kidnapped, which is what this is. Children do not go mis disappear on their own like that. Somebody knows what happened and somebody's a real vicious human being not to at least say what happened because they can't admit it. Now, this, t this Terry person, the stepmother, I definitely get that she's connected and I'm seeing three people, if not four people, another woman and another man. There could be two men because I feel like her son knows something. So maybe he's not present or maybe he just thinks he knows something, but I feel like her actual biological kid knows something at that point. I feel like she tried to enlist his help. She started planning this three months before Chiron went missing. It was in her head. She hated her fucking husband at that time. When she was pregnant with that baby, she hated him because see her goal was to get the baby and to usurp the mother. She was in competition with Desiree and then she was coveting that and then she's sexually possessive. So she get the baby. Of course, when you get the baby, you're doing all the work, meaning you're the woman having the baby. So that means your body's getting, you know, pregnant and you're going to raise the baby. The dad's going to go to work or whatever. And I feel like something about her, he, it feels like her husband was basically quite, her husband is immature. Cain is immature and selfish and all of those things, but not like her. She was being questioned. Something about what she was doing was being questioned. She's been like this since she was little. She's been this way since she was about four. And her family knows the truth as well. Okay, maybe they weren't told the truth, but they know the truth. Now, when I look at Chiron's energy and I look around at the energy, he's kind of showing me that before he disappeared and before she had the second baby, her baby, the baby girl between um, Chiron's father, Cain, and herself, okay, so his stepsister, He's showing me that they were fighting quite a bit. There was a lot of argument. He's covering his ears like this. There's a lot of arguing in the home. And he was telling his mother that. And I feel like she has guilt. Uh, of course she has guilt. I can tell you from losing a child, whether it's an accident and you're completely fine with your kid, you're still going to have guilt. She has a lot of guilt around this. She should not is what he, what it feels like to me. She should not. I don't know how you alleviate it because I have enough trouble on my own. But I feel, I feel with her that she's still carrying it. And what I'm hearing is Okay, she's a very strong woman. They're a strong family. They banded together in order to find Chiron. He's kind of telling me 
he's showing me a shovel. So I feel like he's buried. I don't actually feel like he's thrown in the water. I, I came into the reading thinking he was from the bird watching the binoculars, but I feel that they, okay, this is what I'm going to say. Whoever the woman is with the shovel and kind of the, the, she kind of has darker hair and it's got some streak gray streaks or gray coming through. She's like, like medium brown, but it's that, it's that, that drab ashy color, no offense, but it's that color. And she kind of wears jeans. She's chunkier. I, she looks, you know, like a hippie kind of lesbian combination woman. So tomboyish is a description. And she's standing on a hill in her backyard. Okay. So this feels like her backyard. She's standing on a hill with a shovel and she's digging. I don't think he's there but I am being shown her with a shovel. Then I'm seeing binoculars. So I feel like somebody can look to where he is with binoculars from their house and it's halfway on a hill. So I know that he was moved around. There was a definite bait and switch with where they took this little boy and where they left the body. He was unconscious at the time that he passed away. And I do feel like it was very quick and very sudden. I don't feel like he was beat up. I don't feel anything like that. I literally feel like he was drugged, given something to make him sleep. And then basically that's all I'm seeing is that he kind of passed out of this world. And it was pretty quick within four hours after leaving the school. So when I'm looking at this, I don't think he felt anything. And when I'm asking in my head, and when I say that, I get impressions that come through my head. But when I'm asking if they're ever going to find where he was put, I'm seeing everybody with zippers across their mouth. Their zippers across their mouth. No one's talking. But it's interesting because somebody will talk. It's still going to be like another three years from now. And somebody will talk about something that they saw, which doesn't have anything to do with anything they think. But it's going to lead to a series of events. And it's going to lead to information coming out. But it's very long. And this... This, I feel, is more a karmic balance for the stepmother. This is something she has to live with even longer and purposefully. Like at a certain point, it's purposeful. And I will tell you something that I picked up that's just random. At the end of this three-year time frame, I see her being strung up. And I was thinking like suicide hanging, that kind of thing. But I don't know if that means legal, strung up left out to dry, strung up and left up to dry. That's kind of how I'm seeing it with her. So I don't think she's gonna get off of this life or out of this life easily without first dealing with what happened or, or what she was involved in. Now, when I look at the energy with her, I'm gonna say it again, I would not be surprised if she wasn't overly sexual with her own child. I think the reason that she got angry with Chiron is because obviously he was seven, he's a baby, and she's known him for a while, and she can't really be sexual or get him to be affected in that way because he's too young. So he was starting to defy her or she could feel it as defiance. And this was a problem for her. So this problem for her was something that she didn't really know how to deal with. And so she couldn't, she couldn't maneuver this child the way that she was used to maneuvering people. Everybody this woman deals with, it comes at it from a sexual point of view. There's never just like, you're my friend or, you know, you're my parent or you're my son. It's all coming at it from that energy, which is very, very root chakra energy. And she's coming at it with an intellectual twist. So she kind of knows that if she approaches things that way, she's figured out how to harness her energy. Whoever her partner is right now is aware of what she did, although isn't really dealing with it correctly. So in denial on some level about what she did. So I think she may have given him a souvenir, a token, said something, um, included him in something. I wonder if she was dating. I think I heard she got married again, but I wonder if she was dating this man at the time that Chiron went missing, because I feel there's a connection to him as well, which would make him person number four and a half slash five, because I'm not sure if I want to include her son in that or not. I'm kind of wavering on it. But this is the energy I feel around his passing. And this is just a quick video on it, but I felt compelled to do it. So once again, my name is Sloan from SloanBella.com.